Hi, everyone. Welcome to Flock Talk. I'm Erin Morgan. And I'm Tom Lewis. And we work for the farmer members of the Ontario Sheep Farmers Organization. This week, the topic is marketing, and we will be interviewing Matthew Rowe with the Canadian Campaign for Wool. Welcome, Matthew. Can you, you Can you tell us a little bit about the Campaign for Wool and uh, for those who might be hearing about it for the first time? Yeah, so the Campaign for Wool was created globally by our patron, uh, His Majesty King Charles III. Uh, and so it was launched globally in 2010. And then it came to Canada, uh, was launched by then the, the Prince of Wales and Duchess of Cornwall on a windy pier in Picto, Nova Scotia in 2014. So so nine years ago, I and mean, we're coming up on, so 2024 will be our 10th anniversary in Canada. So again, we... Uh, uh, but but we are part of this this global network with its with its origins all starting with uh, His Majesty. So recently there was a meeting of the International Wool Textile um, Organization in Montreal, and thank you for the invitation. It was a great event to attend. This was the first time the meeting was held in Canada. Can you tell us a little bit about the event and what was achieved during that meeting? Yeah, so this is, I guess, going back a little bit, you know, what we've tried to do um, with the Campaign for Wool in Canada and, and the Canadian Wool Council is really um, look at what are the, the systemic barriers to to growing and developing our, our wool industry. You know, the wool industry is one of the oldest industries in Canada. Uh, it goes back to the very origins of Canada itself. Uh, it was Wool was literally our first currency. Um, and uh, so it, it, it's had a place in the in Canadian society for a very long time. It hasn't always been profitable. Um, the industry itself has had a, a lot of ups and downs. Um, and uh, when we were launched in Canada after, after um, their majesties uh, kicked it off, um, you know, we started to look at uh, it, we began, of course, as as a marketing initiative, and it was all about just promoting wool as a natural, sustainable fiber. And it was looking at all wool. Um, but the more we worked in the space, the more we heard from from producers, from uh, from mill owners, that you know we needed to. Uh, specifically focus on what we could do for Canadian wool. And so a few years ago, um, we, we invested a, a lot of resources into developing the industry's very first strategic plan. Um, and that included three major goals, which was to rebrand and revalue Canadian wool, um, to connect the entire Canadian wool value chain, and to give Canadian wool a, a voice on the international stage. And it's in that third mission uh, that the meeting you mentioned sort of falls into. So when we started to look at how we could better learn from what other similar countries were doing with their wool, uh, we learned about the International Wool Textile Organization, which is kind of the United Nations of wool. It's the, the global authority for the wool trade. And everyone was there and has been there for, you know, 93 years. So you've got the biggest producers like China, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, and then smaller producers like Germany, Italy, and on and on and on. But everyone was there except Canada. It was a major oversight that in those 93 years, Canada had actually never been a member. So what we did was we helped to secure Canada's first ever seat. Uh, and then once we were there, once we populated the working groups with Canadians um, and started to engage in the work of the IWTO, um, we started to look at, again, how how we could sort of deepen that relationship. And then the opportunity came to host one of their meetings for the very first time in Canada. And we we kind of leapt at that opportunity and put forward Montreal because Montreal is the uh, traditional sort of textile uh, heartland uh, of Canada. And so it was a, it was a perfect place to, uh, to bring the global wool industry to. So in, in terms of what was achieved, um, you know, it was uh, two full days of, uh, of, of presentations. And then on either end, there were some, some other events and uh, industry visits and things like that. But first and foremost, um, what, what it gave us was this was this was literally the global industry's first chance to see the Canadian situation on the ground, to learn about uh, the kind of fiber our farms produce, to learn about the companies that are using Canadian wool in products, those that are using wool perhaps not Canadian, you know, one of the, but are, are actually, you know, global leaders in what they do. So, you know, an example of that was Montreal's own Peerless, um, which is probably the biggest company that, 
um, that those in the wool industry have never heard of um, because it's a, it's a Montreal based clothing manufacturer and they, they manufacture millions of suits every year, primarily for the American market. Um, and, and, but also Mexico uh, and they are a massive, massive company. Um, but again, despite being in Montreal, despite being this, you know, uh, nearly 100-year-old um, Canadian company. Again, they've never used Canadian wool. So this was a great opportunity to to not only show our, our, our wool industry capabilities to the world, but also to learn from each other. Uh, and uh, and so I think that was the other big win of those those couple days in Montreal was, you know, I was saying just before we began, this is the first time that we've had this many uh, value chain partners under one roof uh, and being able to have all of those people together to be hearing about the latest trends, the latest opportunities. You know, you can feel sort of a palpable energy in the room. Um, and uh, and you don't always get that in the wool industry. You know, sometimes you can feel like you're you're tilting against windmills or that you're sort of a lone voice in the wilderness. So to all of a sudden be in a room that these are all the people that are doing something with wool and and seeing what's working and what isn't. Um, it was really, really inspiring. Um, so, yeah, and I, I, I that uh, I think those were some of the, the, the biggest achievements. I mean, there was a lot of behind the scenes chatter in terms of deals being made, uh, you know, people asking to buy wool, people asking to source Canadian products. Um, so there was a lot of sort of commercial deals on the side. Um, so we haven't quantified all of that yet. Yet. Um, but I think first and foremost, it was awareness to the world and awareness within the Canadian industry of what we're capable of. That is amazing. And I'm so excited to hear that. Um, and speaking of what we're capable of, there are rumors that Canadian wool isn't very high quality. Um, what is Canadian wool used for and how does it compare to other countries wool? So the... Um, it, we and we've heard this actually time and time again. I think when we first got into this space, there was this idea that oh, Canadian wool is worthless. That was what we were hearing um, from 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 even producers. Uh, you, you know, it was this very, you know, the, the wool is isn't good for anything. Um, you know, there's no value to it. You know, we're lucky if we do get some pennies by selling it on the global commodities market, um, and, and that's that. And I think when we a few years back, when we started, when we did our strategic plan and we brought in some of these experts from from around the world, as well as from across Canada. And what we started to hear back was actually, no, no, you've got actually a really good micron range. You know, the bulk of what you're producing, um, that's good wool and you can do a lot of good things with it. Now, that, uh, you know, I think the, the, the way that we've sort of treated that clip uh, in, in recent years hasn't been great because, again, we've, we've sort of it's become a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And by deriding the quality of the wool, the quality has actually gone down. And then again, it just the only um, places that have wanted to buy it are those that are willing to, you know, put up with its quote unquote imperfections, um, but then not get a lot of value for it. You know, what what we were um, seeing at this meeting was a number of companies who've actually taken Canadian wool and have um, created high value added products. So our, our keynote, for example, was uh, a Montreal based company who, you know, it, it's a fashion startup, but he set himself for the challenge, the challenge of creating an entire line, not even just one product, but an entire line of Canadian wool products, sweaters, vests, toques, gloves, like it, all in 100% Canadian wool. And as anyone who's tried to do something like that themselves knows, it's a big challenge, but he did it. Um, and again, and his company has done very well as a result. We heard from a, a partner that that the campaign has been working with out in British Columbia that is set to become the second big rug company to produce 100% Canadian wool rugs. Again, a very high value added product and, and not where we're looking to bring in, you know, this isn't uh, wool that doesn't exist. This is using the median clip of what exists in Canada right now, but transforming it into a high value added product. So those were kind of some of the the uh, inspiring ideas that really, I, I, I think, you know, we've been believers for a long time now that, you know, the Canadian wool is very valuable. Um, but if there was any doubts in our mind, uh, th those couple days in Montreal sort of wiped those fears away in, in terms of seeing companies that, that believe in Canadian wool and want to do something about it. 
Thank you, and it was a great opportunity, and uh, and thank you for arranging that. The um, the Campaign for Wool is a member of the Canadian Wool Council. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Canadian Wool Council, what they do, and how they're different from the Campaign for Wool? Yeah, so the campaign, we, we get this question a lot. I mean, we began as the Campaign for Wool, and we began as a, a program of His Majesty's Canadian Charitable Office, but we were sort of one initiative. And in fact, that's how I got into uh, into this space was I, I worked for uh, then His Royal Highness, and we had a, a variety of charitable initiatives, and this was one um, that we were asked to launch in Canada. And But then it, it really seemed to have legs, and it grew, and it grew, and, and it still remained remain sort of the primary program. But once we've grown to a certain point, you know, we we spun it off, pardon the pun, um, uh, and the Canadian Wool Council was created to be this vehicle to move to move the industry forward. Again, we it only when the campaign started, it was just primarily an educational and a marketing initiative. Um, but the, the more we worked in the space, the more we saw that there was a vacuum in terms of uh, what was required to help move the industry forward. And and that's where um, through the, the Canadian Wool Council is kind of that wider umbrella um, that looks to, whereas, you know, again, the campaign is, you know, it's creating films, it's creating events, it's creating projects that, that demonstrate what's possible with wool. The Wool Council has been looking at a, a lot of those deeper systemic issues of how we how we build capacity how do we get more canadian wool to market how do we build commercial partnerships that are going to maybe get some media for us in the beginning but that are going to be viable long-term destinations for canadian wool they're going to pay a premium price to to producers uh, and also create a product that they can be proud of. I think part of the problem with the old system was, you know, no one was happy. You know, the, the, the producers weren't getting very much money. Um, and and it was just going into kind of a it was going overseas and you never knew what happened to it. And it was gone. Um, you know, a priority for us has been creating these Canadian wool products that we know exactly, you know, where that wool is coming from. And it's, and it's something that the producers that are feeding into those, those products can justly be proud of that. This is something that that's gorgeous. That's, you know, that that's beautiful. That is a, a premium product. And that is also in some cases flying the flag for Canada, you know, our very first rug partnership, which is still ongoing with Toronto based creative matters. Um, they produce rugs for, amongst other clients, the Canadian government. And so our 100% Canadian wool rugs are now adorning floors in diplomatic missions around the world. And up until that point, again, they were still buying their rugs, but they weren't Canadian. They were being made of, they were being made of New Zealand uh, and Nepalese wool. Um, so again, just just by kind of working on these little projects, all of a sudden you you build an industry one brick at a time, and and again being able to create something that everyone involved in that value chain can justly be proud of. So you spoke about um, some of those systemic issues, and uh, and also the Canadian Wool Council's uh, strategic plan, and uh, so how are you addressing those? Um, systemic issues in the strategic plan. Do you have a couple of examples for us? Yeah. So one of the biggest ones that is that is that still sort of bedevils our industry is is a lack of scouring um, infrastructure. So there's we have a lot of very small scale scouring in Canada, um, but very little sort of medium sized and no like large scale. Um, and so that holds back a lot of our product from market. So you know one of two of the plans that we've looked at in the past two years, for example, one was looking at. Um, a chain for carpets and another was looking at a chain for upholstery and it involved temporarily outsourcing um, some of that scouring to facilities in other countries where the capacity is light years ahead of what Canada can do and the scale. And so and so one of our partners actually sort of implemented that in, in, in very recently, uh, where again, they took the model we came up with in the carpet plan, and they sent a container of Canadian wool over to the UK to a plant that is capable in one week of handling the entire Canadian clip. So when you have capacity like that, um, you can all of a sudden, you know, address some of these um 
uh, economies of scale of of getting Canadian yarn sort of to to a better a better price point. So that's that's one example. Others is, is just using you know existing infrastructure but repurposing it for products that you know that people haven't thought to to use. So for example, with our rugs, um, we source all of the wool from that from the famous Briggs and Little Mill in New Brunswick, which is primarily known for their knitting yarns. Um, but we we source their single ply yarn, and that is used in the creation of both hand knotted and hand tufted carpets. Um, so again, it, it, in some cases you 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 have to find you know outside the box solutions. In other cases, you know the solutions are already there. It's just about you know knitting a supply chain back together, uh, or where either it had fallen apart or where it never existed. So so those are some of the those are some of the the challenges that we're tackling, you know, looking at um another big issue is around branding. So again, because we sort of derided our wool for so long, you know, there wasn't really a sense of what Canadian wool even was anymore. Um so you see that through our 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 um, Fabric of Canada series uh where we've created films to tell the really amazing sort of uh, stories of the wool industry across this country and use that in a way that's, you know, very, very visual storytelling, kind of like, um, you know, the uh, the Newfoundland tourism ads kind of come to mind for a lot of them where, where we're capturing the flavor of Canada and sort of, and presenting it in a way so that that foreign buyers, um, customers who know nothing about Canadian wool, can leave with this impression that no, this is a this is a country that's been working in this space for a long time, that has a proud heritage, and that that kind of knows what they're doing. And uh, and so yeah, so the, the that's one of the other areas that we're working in. So it's a lot of behind the scenes stuff, and and uh, you know about ten percent of it is kind of in front of the curtain uh, to uh, to show off to the world. So we spoke recently about the IWTO meeting in uh, in Montreal, and at that meeting, mm -hmm. um, the federal government, through the Honorable Lawrence McCauley, announced uh, around um, 185,000 for the Canadian Wool Council to continue advancing a more sustainable wool industry in Canada and spreading awareness about Canadian wool. Can you maybe speak to us about how you see this federal investment supporting the sector? Yeah, so um, the area, so it's through the agri marketing program. So first of all, um, thank you to the government of Canada for um, once again showing uh, their confidence that this is this is a space and this is an industry where they see potential and and where Canada has has room to grow. You know, they had it granted um, for wool for no one seems to know when if ever um but uh, certainly it, it would have been if they had put money in the wool industry it, it, at all it would have been a very long time ago um but again it was an example of what it you know when you have a, a renewed vision um and you can you can bring in partners that may have said no in the past i mean we actually when we got our first funding commitment uh, 2 years ago uh which as i say was the first that anyone could remember giving to wool in ages um we were required to sign up for the Brand Canada program as part of that. They they were all confused. They actually wouldn't let us sign up for the Brand Canada program because they're like, "Oh, you're not an agricultural product," and we're like, "Yes, we are." <laughs> and so, so like the the language, the fact it was it was all very blinkered around. I don't know. It's only food, and so. And it's like, well, actually, no, there's there's many other products that come from ag um, that are not food, um, but that are also have value added. And so it was nice to see this time around, we had no trouble uh, joining the Brand Canada initiative um, because they'd expanded their definition. But so, so I think what we've been able to do is we've been able to bring the federal government along with with us for this journey of, of remaking the industry and where they've made investments uh, are in the area around branding. Um, so obviously, they're very interested in export promotion and promoting 100% um, Canadian wool value added products. So again, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, in the past, we were just we were just exporting raw wool. And that's not really of interest to the government because it's a very low there, there's no literally no value added to that. The, the value is added in another country and the money is made further on down that value chain. What where they bought into our vision is looking at, you know, again, these these. 100% Canadian wool products that we're developing in partnership with the private sector, in partnership with 
with producers and mills and so forth. Um, and they see the potential again to sell that to the world and sell and and, and have this be a value added export product. So the uh, a, a big chunk of that money is devoted to continuing our branding and marketing work, the social media, the films, um, you know, coming up with with ways of portraying to um, customers abroad of, of just how special Canadian wool is and how amazing the products made with it are and how they they speak to the story of Canada in general. The other big portion of what that federal money is to support is our work with the IWTO. So they, they see the value in being plugged in to the world um, and in supporting meetings like we had in Montreal, where we bring, you know, the the, the grown-up table of wool uh, to Canada and 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 get them to to learn more about that industry, but also consider consider investing, consider buying Canadian wool products for their stores, considering how they could fit in to a supply chain to produce more value-added Canadian products. So those are kind of the the two areas where the government investment is is earmarked for is is again branding and marketing and for um, developing this international relationship. And it's it's a lot more than just the conferences. It's also there's um, a day to day work that goes on behind the scenes with all the different working groups, including the interiors working group, which Canada chairs. Um, but we have Canadian representation on on all of the working groups. And if there is an area which include, you know, biosecurity, uh, animal welfare, uh, it, it covers, again, the gamut of, of issues affecting the industry. So, again, if there is uh, an area that your members are interested in supporting or becoming involved in, we would love to hear from them. Uh, and uh, because there's there's always more work than there is hands. Um, so so again, that's an area where where we would love to involve more producers. Um, so but but yes, to answer your question, I think th those are those are the, the the two key areas that the government is investing in. Amazing. <clears throat> so. Speaking of producers and investing in producers, uh, if uh, if producers are interested in selling their wool into a high end market, and uh, and you know they're they're excited by the opportunities that we've been discussing, what do producers need to do to improve the quality of their wool, or to um, segregate their wool, or to to basically get their foot into the market uh, that you're talking about, the higher end wool market? How do producers get involved in that? Yeah, so it's about um, you know just the, the easiest bit is you know trying to reduce your the VM so your the vegetable matter in in your wool so that that comes down to how how you're feeding you know the kind of bedding you're using um, but uh, you know trying to to find ways to reduce the amount of VM in your clip when you are shearing you know skirting your fleeces um, be, uh, you know th these are all things that that they're not. You know, can be implemented fairly easily, um, and and to and and will get you that better price um, for the wool because it means less. You know, if there's more VM, it means that there has to be a way to take it out, uh, and uh, and that, that those can be expensive processes. Um, so again, that that ups the quality. Um, when you're looking at kind of longer term solutions, you know, it's looking at looking at the genetics of of uh, you know as as you're breeding your sheep. You know, um, we 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 understand that the majority of sheep are bred for meat. Um, but if you have an option of you know breeding between you know a sheep that otherwise are are equally good on the meat side, um, but one has much better wool, then choose the better wool. You know, always always look and see how you can be improving improving your your micron, improving you know, the handle. It's also important to know that there's you know there's different uses for different kinds of wool. So you know you can't you can't hope that you know a Rito Arcot is going to give you the same kind of fleece as as a Rambouillet. It's just you know it, it, you can work on that as like a genetic project, but that's going to take a while. Um, so it's I, I think another part of it of getting the most value is understanding you know where do you want your wool to go or where is where is there an opportunity and kind of work backwards of well what does the carpet industry need to make kind of the best the best possible wool uh, yarn um, and and how does that you know so start to talk to the manufacturers start to talk to the scours um, I think when we first got involved in this industry we were amazed by how little 
people talk to each other <laughs> within within e even adjacent points of the value chain. There was often very sort of clear lines of like, you know, you sold it and then you stopped caring about it. Um, and and with an industry as complex as wool, you know, for to be able to move it from, you know, off the sheep's back into, you know, some of these products, there's a lot of processes. Um, so getting to know, you know, the different kinds of um, the strengths of the wool that you're raising. And again, what are the sorts of end uses and kind of work backwards of how do I, how do I make it easier on those, those um, in between steps to, uh, to be able to, to, to extract the most value and, and ensure that kind of everyone along the way can sort of make a, a, a good amount of money. I mean, and then that's, I guess that's one of the reasons why our focus has been on high value added products, because we want to, uh, and there's a place certainly for, um, for wool that isn't suitable for any other form of um of use to have some some lower value added applications you know you've seen some great initiatives around say you know insulation or pelleting um but the the bulk of canadian wool is actually better it it, it has a lot more potential than that um and so putting it into things like carpeting rugs upholstery um these are uh even even filtration i mean there's this amazing company in new zealand that um is is doing air filtration systems that are made primarily of wool, uh, and again, a very high value added product. Um, but they're you know they're using their air filters like in um, in space exploration, like what, like so sheep get to go to the moon. Like <laughs> so, cool. I mean, they, these are the kind of these are the kind of products that we uh, you know that we should be focusing our efforts on. Um, and uh, and so so yeah, so I think the first step for a producer thinking about you know how they can get more money for their wool is is you know start to think about where it's going where where some of these end use cases are and you know as we grow more of these product offerings we're going to be seeking out more producers so it becomes a um you know a, again a, a virtuous cycle in terms of 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 getting a a, a, a a each round a clearer idea of what it is that the manufacturer needs and therefore being able to convey that to the producer and that they improve their product and then thus the end product is improved and 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 it goes on like that so um so i think but as a first step just thinking about how you can make your wool better thinking about where it goes afterwards uh, can go a long way to getting more money um but then also setting yourself up to be able to supply some of these higher value added products i'm still processing sheep on the moon yeah, at least there will on the moon. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> absolutely. So we have one uh, final question, and um, we're sure you've been asked this all the time. Um, since you work for His Majesty's Campaign for Wool, have you met King Charles? I have, yes. Um, yes, I do, do get this question a lot. Um, I, 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 Having worked for, as I mentioned, you know, I got into the space by working for His Majesty's Canadian Charitable Office years ago uh, when he was Prince of Wales. And so we had the good fortune both to um, greet him in Canada to show off our different programs, including the Campaign for Wool, um, as well as bring supporters uh, to the UK and see see some of his work there. So so I've had the the, the opportunity to meet him many times over, over the, the last decade. Uh, and what I can say is that he, 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 you will never, we are so lucky to have a, a patron who is so passionate, who really like, he takes, he takes sort of the, you know, 40,000 feet view of what the industry needs, but then he can dive right down to the specifics, to, right down to being, you know, the nitty gritty of racing sheep, because he is in addition to being the king, he's also a sheep farmer <laughs> and he has his own flocks. Um, and so so he he knows sort of what it takes to um, to raise sheep and to bring, you know, meat and wool to market. But then also, again, sees, you know, this much larger industry and the, the and the supports that it needed. I mean, when he created the campaign for wool uh, in 2010 it was because he saw an environment particularly in the fashion side of things where you know you saw markets being dominated by fast fashion which were being driven by cheap synthetic fibers being made in uh criminally low wage jurisdictions <laughs> um emphasis criminally is on mine but <laughs> is on my side um but uh but again he saw this where again we were we we, we sort of lost touch with um with natural fibers and and with 
the the sort of quality that that they can create, particularly wool. You know, wool garments are often uh, very long lasting and enduring. Um, but uh, but again, but it had all these technical benefits. So so the campaign for wool was out of this where he saw sort of farmers, he saw mill owners sort of crying out for you know we need we need a better coordinated kind of educational campaign. Um, and at the same time, sort of consumers sort of losing touch with, you know, fibers that have served us well since the dawn of civilization. So, so I think, again, us with the campaign, we are so fortunate to have a patron like that who, who is so engaged. I mean, we, we, we last, I last saw him in Canada, uh, during his last visit as Prince of Wales, um, uh, in, uh, in 2022. Two, uh, I believe <laughs> that was that two years, or it, it seems like forever ago. I know, but the in, pandemic, in, we've lost time. <laughs> I know, I have no sense of time anymore. But it was in Newfoundland, uh, and again, we were able to show off some of the amazing wool products we were developing. He was able to meet with a, a hundred year old Newfoundland wool cooperative that we were profiling in one of our films. He was meeting with a prairie artisan who did those incredible sculptures of uh, of, um, uh, of of both him and his mother. Um, totally needle felted with Canadian wool. Again, cool. just a totally outside the box way of thinking what is possible with wool. So, um, and then he keeps regularly informed through the updates that we send him uh, and through our global chair, uh, Sir Nicholas Coleridge. Um, and uh, again, the campaign operates in 13 different countries. So it, it's really amazing to see sort of what what he's been able to achieve. And, you know, and again, we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, someone with his kind of vision uh, sort of lighting the way for us. So he's a lot of fun, <laughs> I guess is the other aside is that is that he really he really cares about this stuff. So he gets he gets right into it, you know, when he's chatting with the knitters. Um, like he 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 wants to engage with other people who share his same passion. So uh, so he's he's a good boss to have. Well, that's fantastic. And I can definitely feel your passion for the industry, which is so exciting and so infectious. And we're uh, we're really happy to be working with you, Matthew, and really, really appreciate the time that you've taken today to share the wool industry with us and to um, give us an update on everything that the Campaign for Wool is doing. And uh, we're really excited to be working with you at uh, Ontario Sheep Farmers on furthering the campaign uh, and all of the goals of the um, Canadian Wool Council and uh, and the Campaign for Wool. So thank you so much. And for more information about the Campaign for Wool, visit www.campaignforwool.ca. And thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this marketing episode with the Campaign for Wool. Join us next Wednesday for our education-themed interview with Ontario sheep producer Ted Skinner, who will talk about he and his wife's farm operation and involvement in the sheep sector. Ted is also the recipient of the 2023 Outstanding Shepherd Award. Hey Tom, what's new? Ontario Sheep Farmers recently started the Flock Talk podcast that you're listening to, a weekly podcast series bringing you ideas, insights from fellow producers, industry experts covering research, marketing, education, news, updates, and more. This podcast comes out every Wednesday, and the creation of this came from the 2021 OSF Crossroads Challenge and better connecting with Ontario sheep farmers and producers across the province. If you have suggestions for topics and discussions, you can email me, T. Lewis, at ontariosheep.org, or Aaron Morgan, E. Morgan, at ontariosheep.org. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe to your podcast app to receive alerts to our future episodes, and please share our podcast with your friends. For more Ontario Sheep Farmers content, follow us on social media at Ontario Sheep Farmers, on Instagram and Facebook at Ontario Sheep, on X, formerly Twitter, and visit our website at ontariosheep.org.